What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Joe Dobbini, and I'm an electrical engineer. And today we're going to be discussing are the H-1B visas a danger to electrical engineers, whether you're in college or you're already an employee? How does this affect your future? So let's take a look at it. So for those who don't know what an H-1B visa is, let's go by what the U.S. government has put out and read it. The overview. The H-1B program applies to employers seeking to hire non-immigrant aliens as workers in specialty occupations or as fashion models of distinguished merit and ability. Now, keep in, keep in mind this part as well. The law establishes certain standards in order to protect similar employed U.S. workers from being adversely affected by the employment of non-immigrant workers, as well as to protect the h one B non-immigrant workers. The H-1B program is what intentionally to bring outside workers that are in the USA who are skilled and qualified to fill in gaps in the United States. And today's complaint is there's too many of these companies acquiring outside workers when there's American workers that could be working these jobs. That's pretty much the whole debate. Now, as an electrical engineer myself, how does this affect us? Are these workers outside of the country going to come here and make it harder for you to get that job? The economy is already bad for everybody today. So here are some key important things that we already know about the H-1B visas. One, companies get to spend less per employee. This creates a competitive disadvantage to U.S. workers, although you can be as skilled as the person who's overseas but are are on an H-1B visa, if you guys are the same skill, but the company pays them $20,000 or $30,000 less, they're gonna go with that option and you're gonna have to go find another job. Two, the second thing we already know about H-1B visas is, if you're on an H-1B visa, it's significantly harder for you to get a security clearance. Most people with H-1B visas are not gonna get a security clearance. Security clearance usually requires you to be a US citizen to acquire, and there's a lot of electrical engineering positions that require security clearance for you to be a part of. Those type of jobs are pretty much securely secured for U.S. citizens, which is good on our end when it comes to applying for these jobs. And the third thing I wanted to consider is that not all H-1B visas are considered top talent. Most companies like to advertise that, hey, we're, we're getting a lot of H-1B visas because we're bringing a lot of top talents from different countries. Graduating from MIT doesn't mean they're top talent, right? They did the work. But when it comes to the actual time to perform in the actual work environment field, people change, people crack, and people divert to different directions. Likewise, just because somebody's joining an organization with an H-1B visa doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be a hard worker, a top talent. But in every field, there's always those top talents that, you know, slide right through the cracks as well. So luckily, as an electrical engineer, we have a larger barrier to entry because you can see a lot of electrical engineering positions require security clearance. But not only that, if I were, if you're a software engineer, you are probably going to be more at risk because anybody can pick up a computer, anybody can download PyCharm and start practicing their coding. And over time, someone can either get on the same level as you or even pass you up. And then now you're at the risk of being replaced with somebody who can obtain an H-1B visa and take your position for a significantly less pay. So the ease of entry for software engineers is way easier. That's why you see a lot of the software engineers are complaining more than electrical engineers because they're taking a lot of their jobs. And the thing is, most of the newly software engineer grads are coming out of college. They barely started coding when they were freshmen. Now you look at a lot of these third world countries or other countries where students are already going through the coding process during high school. So by the time you're coming out of college, you have these coders who already maybe have eight years of experience ahead of you, who now you are competing for that same entry level position. So let's look at the H-1B Employer Data Hub. This is from the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services website themselves. If you scroll down, it'll show you all the top employers. So which companies are employing the most H-1B visas? At the top of the list, we have Amazon, who currently employed 9,665, 9, followed by all these companies. Google's number four with 5,000, Meta with 4,800, Microsoft, Apple. And you go down the list, and you know, Elon Musk made the comment, and a lot of people were saying, hey, he's one of the biggest abusers for this H 1B visa. But when you go down the list, Tesla doesn't show up until number 22. So there's 21 companies that employ more H-1B visas. So 
mind you, at the same time that all these companies are hiring H-1B visas, that means you, as a U.S. citizen, those are jobs being taken away from you. And there's pros and cons in everything. He, he did give an example how whenever we're trying to, like a, like a soccer team, right? Do you think Barcelona or Real Madrid will be the best team in the world today if they could only find players from Spain? I don't think that would be the case. But the fact that they can bring in workers, players from other countries who are top skilled, top notch, and join their team, now that collective team full of talents from around the world makes a great and amazing team that stands at the top of the billboards. Likewise, his point was, hey, if you have a tech company and you're trying, let's say there's some talent overseas that are the best and you want to bring them in, you should be able to bring them in and that should be a pathway. And there's some truths to this because in my graduation class, when I graduated in 2022 with my electrical engineering degree, there was only 15 of us who graduated with our degree. And most of my friends are all employed. Those who have, those that graduated with me in the electrical engineering degree, I don't recall any of them being unemployed. So as of right now, they're all employed. So with only 15 or so of us graduating with our electrical engineering degree, they completed the, our senior design projects, you know, from a university that has thousands of students and there's only 15 electrical engineer graduates that December, that's not enough to fill in the gaps in the economy. And if a company is looking for electrical engineers and there's not enough and then to go overseas, people are still going to make fun of them because they're not hiring American workers. But do we have enough electrical engineers who got the degree and are also looking for electrical engineering degrees? Because I have some friends who did graduate with me and they don't want to be electrical engineers. They didn't like the course, but they already were too far along in the degree to quit. So now out of that 15, you already lost some that who that don't want to do electrical engineering at all. So let's take a look at the top H1B sponsors by job title, software engineer. So if you look at which company sponsored the most software engineers, right? You can see Google, all these companies that are on the list. Look at those numbers, right? Now compare that to electrical engineers, boom. There's barely any electrical engineers being imported in for re regarding the H1B visas. And that's probably for obvious reasons that we discussed earlier. It could be clearance reasons, it could be lack of infrastructure over there. And so electrical engineers are pretty much safe for now, right? I don't know how the world will change as other companies start developing their tech, then, you know, people from other countries can get more experience. Because as of right now, right, the, the leverage that I have over somebody who may be coming out of India or Africa is that the company that I'm working with, the technology that we are working with, I'm getting experience with, a lot of those countries will never touch that type of technology maybe in the next 10 years. So although you may be over there working hard and being very proficient at what you guys do, if you haven't been exposed to all the higher level technology, now if somebody over in the US wants to hire you, they gotta retrain you almost as if you are a college student who just graduated because you have to learn and be updated with all these new tech if, versus the software engineers overseas. They can just pick up a laptop and start coding. All of them would need to learn how to use a function drain generator. You know, just all these things that require testing can be very expensive for people who don't have money, which creates a large barrier to entry for it to become an electrical engineer that can work as an H1B visa here in the United States. Now you're looking at this chart. You're seeing how many H1B visas are there are for software engineers, which tells you if you're a software engineer, you must, you must excel. You must become the best because your competition isn't just in the States, but it's now it's worldwide. It's, it's going to be a real hard grind. So, so this is my solution. A solution for electrical engineers and software engineers is you want to leverage your education. Does this mean going back to school and getting your PhD or masters? Not necessarily, but that could help. What I want you to do is become elite in what you do. Become so good that it's very hard to replace. You don't need a master's degree or a, a PhD to be the very best at what you do. There's different specializations in electrical engineering and software engineering that you can specialize and become really, really good at it. Where if they were to try to replace you with the H1B visa, they will still be at a loss. Or even if they wanted to replace you with another U.S. citizen, there will be a loss. So the number one is focus in areas where H-1B visas have a harder 
barrier to entry than you. And make sure you get real good at it because eventually other nations will catch up and other people overseas will start developing the skills that we, that we have the availability to today as electrical engineers. For example, RF engineering, advanced power systems, and aerospace technologies. A lot of foreign countries don't have the tech we have today. That's why a lot of the times as an electrical engineer to work in the US, some of these technologies require you to have a security clearance because they don't want other countries taking our knowledge and making better things. Because at the end of the day, the US wants to be the number one place leading in tech, missiles, whatever it is, defense. We don't want that spilling over. So make sure you're in areas where you can excel and there's a, a larger barrier to entry. Just because you become proficient at what you do, it doesn't mean that's the end of it, right? You still have to network with other employees, create this sort of network because when layoffs come around, sometimes those connections you have in the company or business can save you from being laid off or even replaced. So your connections in certain places, networking can save you a lot of time. And not only that, if you were to be replaced by an H-1B visa for some reason, you can still find another opportunity fast. Today, most electrical and most engineers are finding new jobs when they get laid off or removed from other places by connections. It's, it's gotten so much harder for you to just go for online and apply for a company because not only are you applying, but for that same position, you know, there could be 80 U.S. citizens applying for it and a thousand H-1B visas applicants applying for that same position. So being connected through networks can put you ahead of the table straight into the interview process. So whether they say yes or no, you already got that. You already got that interview completed and you can move forward. As you can see, H-1B visas are definitely not going to go away because there are gaps in our economy that we do need help in and you know, I'm not a politician. I don't know what the future holds, but I know what I can do to try my best to avoid being replaced by somebody who has an H-1B visa. If that is your complaint, make sure you get really good at your craft, become excellent, become a professional network, create connections, because at the end of the day, those networks that you have can almost trump your skill in the field. So tell me what you think in the comment section down below. What are your thoughts about the H-1B visa? Do you think it hurts? the US economy, you think it hurts our working environment or do you support it and you think it's very helpful? If you've ever been, if you've ever experienced a negative experience working with anybody with the H-1B visa or you think it hurts company, let us know in the comment section. I'm very interested to hear from you guys from your very own perspectives and I'll see you guys in the next video. Jadavini is out.